uh, we did this the agenda uh, of the, the adoption of the agenda is uh, is uh, uh, concluded and uh, the approval of the minutes members should be asked to approve the minutes before the committee meeting of the 5th and the 7th september <coughs> if no objections are raised the minutes are adopted and then let me quickly go to the announcement before starting the hearing excuse me I don't think so. Let me have a check. I did say what translations we have. Not on my list. I don't have any Croatian. I'm so sorry. <coughs> we are dependent on what uh, the DGs tell us what is possible, but we will try next time to get Croatian uh, interpretation. Then changes in order of the hearing for the topics of November. These are in the announcements now. Um, we are preparing and planning the next pillar of our committee on the socio-economic impact uh, of the pandemic. And the provisional program will kick off on the 14th of November with the hearing on the impact on the labor market and the working conditions. And next we will hold a hearing on the socio-economic impact on vulnerable people on the 28th of November. The following day, the 29th of November, we will have a full programme with a hearing on gender, gender of the pandemic and we will com welcome Commissioner Gentiloni in the afternoon together with experts for the evaluation of the performance of financial support instruments. And finally, in December, we will invite speakers on the topic of health institutions and hold a very specific hearing on the impact on children. And then I come to my last announcement. Um, it was uh, unfortunately impossible uh, for this committee to hear all pharmaceutical companies in the COVID-19 response. And Valneva, who couldn't, well, there was just too many. Um, uh, but um, I'm very glad that I can say they agreed to give a written contribution to the members of this committee. And you will have received this contribution in your mailbox so that Valneva is not completely not uh, present. Dear colleagues, I would like now to start with our first hearing of today and I would like to very warmly welcome, as I already did, Mrs. Janine Small, President of the International Development Markets um, uh, Advisor and Dr. Franz Werner Haas, Chief Executive Officer of CureVac and their assistants or uh, whom they can give the floor if, if there are questions um, that uh, they would like them to answer. And uh, with further ado, I would like to proceed and give the floor to Mrs. Um, Small and then um, uh, to CureVac. Um, both of you have like 10 minutes to give an introduction and then we go to the hearing and that means that according to a speaker's list, um, uh, uh, members will ask questions <coughs> by two or three um, at a time and then you can answer uh, these questions. Um, but Mrs. Small, please, you have the floor. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Char Chair Van Brent, and uh, thank you again for your very warm welcome. It's very much appreciated. And uh, honourable members of the Special Committee, I am really pleased to be here with you today. Um, I would like to start by expressing Pfizer's desire to continue partnering with the EU policymakers as we fight COVID-19. I do hope today's discussion can foster a common understanding of what succeeded and where improvements may be needed so we can be better positioned for future challenges. Last year, more than one out of every six people on earth used a Pfizer medicine or vaccine. This, of course, makes us all at the company very proud. As of the 18th of September of this year, we have delivered more than 3.8 billion vaccines to 181 countries and territories in the region of the world. And to date, over half the population in Europe have received a Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And as of the 21st of September of this year, we have shipped more than 31 million treatment courses of our oral treatment to 44 countries globally. What pleases me most about these numbers is not their sheer magnitude, but the fact that they represent real people, including children from all around the world who were helped by what our scientists discovered and brought to market. Of course, we did not accomplish this alone. Our success depended on the power of science and the power of collaboration. 
key was our partnership with a small European biotechnology company with whom we'd already been working before the pandemic. Biontech was once a relatively unknown company in Germany, but today it is a household name. By combining our complementary capabilities, Pfizer and Biontech have contributed substantially to getting the pandemic under control. What Pfizer and Biontech have accomplished is an inspirational model for the future. I'm also proud of the unprecedented level of collaboration with the European Commission, national governments and global health stakeholders such as the COVAX facility as we battle to help protect public health and minimise the devastating social and economic impacts of COVID-19. We are committed to working towards equitable access to our oral treatment as well. Pfizer has closely collaborated with WHO and its partners in the therapeutic pillar of the access to COVID-19 tools accelerator, which is known as ACT-A, as well as other initiatives such as the COVID treat Treatment Quick Start Consortium to accelerate treatment and improve access to treatments in under-resourced parts of the world. Our voluntary license agreement with the Medicines Patent Pool, MPP, has led to 38 sub-licenses being given to countries who will be able to supply the generic version of our oral treatment to 95 low- and middle-income countries across the world. Beyond the pandemic, equitable global access to all our medicines is a top priority at Pfizer. That's why in May, we launched an Accord for a Healthier World, a groundbreaking initiative aiming to provide our patented, high-quality medicines and vaccines available in the US or the EU on a not-for-profit basis to 1.2 billion people in 45 lower-income countries. The Accord seeks to greatly reduce the health inequities that exist between many lower-income countries and the rest of the world. However, the fight is far from over. The virus has not been defeated, and science is telling us that COVID-19 will remain a major global health concern for years to come. As Pfizer, we remain committed to a holistic approach to fighting this pandemic. We continue working towards equitable global access to both our vaccine and oral treatment. We are supporting governments to help ensure access to full vaccine and booster doses for all eligible people as recommended and helping to leverage COVID-19 treatments as complementary tools to vaccination. We are acting with a sense of urgency and preparedness to reduce the impact of both infections and severity of the virus, particularly amongst the high-risk populations. And we support policies that maintain a competitive industrial ecosystem in Europe, notably strong intellectual property protections and open global supply chains. The European Commission rightly stated that we are entering a new phase of the pandemic. We are heading towards the winter a time when respiratory viruses tend to increase. There remains the possibility that a future variant could emerge that combines Omicron's contagiousness with the original virus's severity. And this is a scenario no one wants to imagine, but one for which we need to be prepared. Healthcare systems across Europe continue to experience the impact of COVID-19. From workforce shortages to the immense toll on the mental welfare of healthcare workers. Reducing the number of hospitalizations may decrease the direct medical costs associated with treated COVID 19 and help alleviate issues faced by those on the front line in the pandemic. So, access to treatment is key. Our scientists work every day to stay one step ahead and to be prepared to address whatever challenges the virus throws at us. We continue to follow the science. We invest in research and development and are working to identify vaccines that will help to provide strong and durable protection as new variants emerge. 
The importance of this cannot be underestimated, particularly as we see cases rise across the EU over the last few weeks. I'm also concerned about the continued widespread misinformation about vaccination and the low vaccination rates we are seeing in some countries, including some countries in Europe. For us to succeed, it is essential that we all play our part to increase citizens' confidence and ultimately vaccine uptake, to help keep people protected and for life to return to normal. Certain barriers to accessing COVID-19 treatment are also in place in some European markets, such as restricting those who are eligible for treatment. These must be addressed for the 40% of the population who have an underlying condition or risk factor for severe disease, who may be able to benefit from treatment. We must implement strategies that help societies live with COVID-19 in the long term while protecting the most vulnerable. Two critical enablers have underpinned the collective response to the pandemic, where Europe has provided a strong platform. Firstly, intellectual property protection is foundational to research and development and enables companies to share their technology and information to scale up manufacturing. With a strong and predictable IP framework, sorry, without a strong and predictable IP framework, our collaboration with BioNTech, as well as many other partnerships, would not have been possible. Weakening IP for vaccines and therapeutics would negatively impact research and development needed to tackle pandemics and undermine at-risk investment in production, all without helping improve patient access. A second key enabler was a resilient global supply chain. During the first wave of the pandemic, it was thanks to our global manufacturing network that we were able to respond to a sudden 2,000% increase in demand for ICU medicines in Europe. We began scale-up of our manufacturing at risk before the vaccine or therapeutic had received regulatory approvals or authorizations. The Pfizer-BioNTech global vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine supply chain and manufacturing network now spans four continents and includes more than 20 facilities, many of which are in Europe. The supply of our oral therapy relies on more than 60 materials from 20 supply points, including internal supplies, sites and partners across 10 countries, including Ireland, Italy and Germany. If we are to be flexible and resilient in responding to major health threats, it is vital that supply chains remain open and that goods flow across borders. So in conclusion, let me reiterate that Pfizer takes seriously and deeply and deeply values our role as a partner to the EU and to the governments worldwide. We know that when we work together, when we combine our strengths, when we are unified against a global crisis, we can make the impossible possible. So I'd like to thank you for including Pfizer in this very important hearing, and I also look forward to responding to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. There will be questions, a lot of questions. I'm sure. <laughs> Dr. Haas, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Dear Chair Van Premt, uh, Honourable Members of the European Parliament, thank you very much for inviting also CureVac to speak here today. I can only comment the work being led by the COVID committee, learn from successes and missteps, and ensure that we can do better to prevent and respond to pandemics in the future. The COVID-19 pandemic was a lesson for us all, a test of the seriousness of pandemic that we all knew that this could happen and we all underestimated at the time. New technologies are vital to advance medical progress and hence form the backbone of pandemic preparedness. They cannot be neglected. In 2020, as one of such technologies, mRNA technologies, the technology was at a stage of development to, uh, development to rapidly and flexibly respond to the immediate viral threat. 
it shows that there is a need to generate and secure circumstances for the development of such new technologies, which might even form new industries. CureVac is a pioneer in mRNA and was founded in 2000. It took 20 years of scientific groundwork to make RNA technology available and manufacturable when it was needed most. Still, we are convinced that mRNA technology has just begun and we are committed to providing ongoing in innovation to further realize the full potential of mRNA. More innovation is needed to further address COVID-19 variant dynamics, improve vaccine efficiency, vaccine availability and the distribution logistics far beyond Europe. Highly skilled experts and know-how are cornerstones of this ongoing development as it enables and protects innovation and provides a framework to develop those new technologies needed. Innovations of new technologies also mean the emergence of new industries with demands of completely new infrastructure, new supply chains and regulated processes. For this to happen in record time during COVID-19 pandemic, strong collaboration was and continues to be needed among academics, industry, regulatory authorities and policymakers. CureVac welcomes the creation of DG Hera. DG Hera will allow to continuously identify threats and prevent pandemics while strengthening the critical collaboration needed between all relevant stakeholders of the healthcare sector globally. In the heat of the pandemic, industry players collaborated closely with academic institutions and prioritized the race against the virus over the competitive interests. Regulatory authorities facilitated safe access to mRNA technology in Europe. The launch of the rolling review procedure at EMA was a strong enabler of safe and efficacious vaccines. CureVac welcomed that member states of the European and the European Commission worked hand in hand to support the development and purchase of COVID-19 vaccines. Having one buyer for the whole EU significantly simplified and accelerated this process. The advanced purchase agreements allowed the rapid development of vaccines and granted vaccines to all European citizens at the end. Furthermore, we would like to thank the European Commission and the national governments for successfully overcoming challenges in the supply chain caused by limited access to, at the time, rare raw materials. As you know, our vaccine, CureVax vaccine, didn't make it to the market. Interim data of our vaccine did not fully meet our high expectation of the vaccine and therefore we decided to drop its development when we also saw that vaccines were approved. However, building on our 20 year of research and development, other companies brought to market vaccines that tremendously helped to overcome the crisis. Together with GSK today, we are currently developing a new COVID-19 vaccine that is in phase one and shows okay results. We have four ongoing clinical trials in infectious diseases and beyond COVID-19, our pipeline includes antigens, but also cancer immunotherapies and molecular therapies, all based on mRNA. Manufacturing is key for making new technologies rapidly and broadly available in the event of an, emergence, of an emergency. Large manufacturing capacities were built up and are continued to be built to provide fast and flexible access to large quantities of mRNA vaccines to be rapidly available across Europe and beyond. We are proud to be supported by the German government with a contract for pandemic preparedness similar to the EU FAPS objectives that creates a pandemic preparedness reserve capacity that can be mobilized for future pandemics, built on the lessons learned. Now I would like to conclude with a few lessons learned for us. The pandemic showed what is possible if the world has a common goal. Innovation is crucial in the COVID-19 pandemic and will be equally key in future pandemics. We need to continue investing in R&D to fuel the innovation pipeline. Cross, 
strong cross-national collaboration of industry, governments, healthcare systems and regulatory authorities is the main enabler to safe and effective vaccines. This has removed previous limitations and boundaries. If we identify, prevent and rapidly treat diseases, our hospitals and healthcare systems will not be under pressure and our societies and economics and economies can continue thriving. In this spirit, I would like to reiterate our commitment to collaborating with all EU institutions to contribute to our collective goal of, goal of advancing healthcare for everyone. So thank you again for the opportunity to share QVEC's reflections with you here today with the members of the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Haas and uh, Mrs. Small, for your introductions. And we now go uh, to um, the question and answers. The first round is with uh, representatives of the political groups. And we have the system don't, and then we still have hopefully, but I think so, get, um, also room for catch the eye. Mr. Kimporopoulos, please, you have the floor for two minutes. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and of course, uh, thank you to our speaker, Ms. Small and uh, Dr. Franz uh, Gwenechas, for taking the time uh, to be with uh, us today. And uh, before addressing uh, my question, I just wanted to remind ourselves for which reasons we are here. As long as I guess, we are here to look uh, into the European response to the pandemic and draw the lessons, the right lessons learned for the future. We are not here to make headlines. I would encourage all of us to focus on the substance and not get uh, dragged into discussions about who is representing which company in this hearing. Now, on the substance, we have seen time and again that collaboration between the public and uh, the private sector has been among the most important elements in the fight against the pandemic. Therefore, I wanted to ask you both, how was uh, your cooperation with the competent EU agencies and is there anything that EU can improve when it comes to evaluation and approval of medicines and vaccines? Secondly, as you have mentioned, vaccines require a significant amount of raw materials and ingredients. And our supply chains have been under significant pressure throughout the first stages of this pandemic. Therefore, I wanted to ask you what are, according to your companies, the main lessons we should learn from the pandemic towards the boosting, uh, uh, toward boosting our supply chain's resilience. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Mrs. Serdas, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I would like to start by thanking of the work done by everyone when it comes to tackle this, let's hope, once in a century pandemic. However, uh, transparency is key when using of public money. So my first questions go to Pfizer. And considering the European Courts of Auditor report from 12th of September, uh, where uh, the EU's biggest contract with Pfizer for 1.8 billion doses, it was concluded by this report that this um, contract was concluded outside of the normal negotiating procedure. I would like to also understand um, two things. Why, did, uh, why were more doses secured and why did the price per dose uh, comparatively to, with previous contracts went from 15.5 euros a dose to 19.5 euros a dose? Uh, if you can explain why this increase in price in this third contract and if your company Pfizer will be willing to renegotiate the contract and to settle by, by for less doses given that member states most likely won't uptake and vaccinate use all doses and uh, lastly um, 
I would like to reference by your initial statement that you start by saying that Pfizer wishes to partner and keep partnering with the parliament. However, I must disagree. I believe that uh, the CEO of Pfizer should have been present here and she, he was confirmed until a few weeks ago. And does uh, Mr. Burla's absence has anything to do with the ECHA report that was launched on the 12th of September? And I have another question by Kirvak. We deeply acknowledge that in order for us to reduce inequalities to accessibility to vaccines, we need more vaccines. And also to reduce inequalities when comparing low and middle income countries to uh, higher uh, high income countries. Um, what you, you reference that you have uh, several uh, clinical trials ongoing what will be your most important hurdles when facing those clinical trials and when it comes to the vaccine i i, I reckon you you stated a vaccine on phase one if you had the opportunity i'm concluding if you had the opportunity to uh, compare the that vaccine results with other vaccines uh, existing vaccines already approved so thank you thank sorry you, Thank you, Mrs. Sellers. Not four minutes and 40 seconds. It's the two together. But nonetheless, you were over. Nonetheless, Mrs. Sellers, you were over time. Uh, Mrs. Small and then Ms. Dr. De Haas, please, within two minutes and a half, three minutes to answer the questions. Mrs. Uh, Small. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, very much as well for outlining what we're here for, uh, which is obviously about lessons learned and uh, to really make sure that we can understand what those are, in, not just in the short term, but also in the long term as well. So really appreciate that. Um, actually, coming back to your point on, on lessons learned, I think I would like to take the opportunity to thank the EMA for their flexibility um, in enabling a rolling review of data, which I think is a really important lesson learned, um, and for their incredible work was also maintaining the scientific rigor and independence because that's really important. The uh, regulatory process for, I think, our COVID-19 vaccines has clearly shown that the European community of stakeholders is able to work together to accelerate uh, and optimize the process greatly. So I think um, if we'd be able to take learnings forward from that, I think it would be great if we could um, have some of those approaches in a non-emergency situation. Uh, and I think to improve it even further would be to um, you know, have a regulatory dossier that you can use across both EU and on non-EU situations, if we're thinking about lessons learned uh, moving forward as well. I think the, um, the importance of collaboration, as you highlighted, has just been incredible between the public and the private sectors, um, as well as between companies as well. And I think that's also quite important. But I, I think from that point of view, we also need to understand that the COVID-19 um, you know, pandemic is not over yet. So we do have to be vigilant. We do have to continue to collaborate uh, across the, um, the healthcare communities, the stakeholders, to make sure that we are remaining incredibly, incredibly vigilant um, from that point of view. You talked about um, supply as well. Um, I think the most important thing is, is that, as you mentioned, the manufacturing of our COVID-19 vaccine and oral therapy is a really complex process. And, uh, and I think it might be interesting for you to know that our COVID-19 vaccine involved 280 materials um, across our global operation. And these materials are sourced from 86 suppliers and 19 different countries. And regarding our, our oral treatment, as mentioned in the introductory remarks, it actually takes 60 materials and 20 supply points, um, including, you know, it's important, including internal Pfizer sites, as I mentioned, and also partners across that. So the single most important thing that the EU can do to be able to ensure a robust and seamless delivery uh, of our COVID-19 vaccine and therapeutic will be continue to protect the free movement of goods um, and supply across borders. So that was very important as well. And, um, and we saw that global companies really do rely on those global supply chains. So that would be very important for us to, to continue and to um, maintain. 
Uh, in terms of contracting, um, I know you've talked about the, um, the transparency aspects of these things, but I do, I do believe that we have, from the beginning, engaged in an unprecedented level of transparency throughout the process. This has started way before the contracting. It actually started with our commitment to sharing the details of our clinical trials programme uh, and also publishing the data in um, peer-reviewed journals. We have also provided a redacted copy <clears throat> of our contract available for members of the European Parliament and others to review. But I think you, it's important for us all to acknowledge and understand that the redacted information does actually constitute commercially confidential information. And, uh, and at the same time, we at Pfizer do have to balance that um, with this, this effort of being transparent with governments, with, with working with other governments around the world. I think it's important to, to know that we are still involved in ongoing negotiations. And so therefore, you know, making available details of our contracts um, would prejudice their interests. And I'm sure nobody would want to do that, to prejudice the interests of other governments that are still contracting with us on vaccinations and also regarding our oral treatments. So that's an important point regarding um, the confidentiality of the, of the contracts. And um, regarding your comment about Dr. Boudler, I am very sorry he's not here. And I, I really hope that me being present will be able to help answer some of the questions that you have. We also have other colleagues uh, with Pfizer as well to be able to support any questions needed. Um, your comment was, is, is it because of um, the audit report while he's not here? I can assure you it's not. Um, it's, uh, I'm also feel that I'm probably best placed in order to be able to have these conversations with you. And maybe it might be helpful if I give you a little bit of my background. Um, I've actually been with Pfizer 34 years. Actually, my anniversary of 34 years is today, strangely enough. Um, and also as well, from that point of view, I actually well, am the president of International Developed Markets, of which Europe is part of that. I uh, also is the regional president of the vaccines for IDM and therefore I led the team um, that did the contract and negotiations with the European Commission as well as ex-US. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But we, I have to limit the time. Normally, sorry. two and a half minutes. You didn't answer the question about the pricing. If you, oh, you, sorry. Okay. Do you want me to? No, but we'll come back, we to, back that. to that. We'll come back to that. Dr. Sorry, Haas, time please. goes so quickly. Thank you very much uh, for the questions and also acknowledging what uh, Kyrvek put into this uh, pandemic situation and what we did. Thank you very much for this. I can confirm what we just heard uh, from uh, Mrs. Moll that the collaboration with the EU institutions, the Commission, but uh, uh, even beyond, uh, really worked quite well uh, during the uh, pandemics. Uh, but also including the EMA rolling review. I really have the highest respect for the colleagues in the EMA working over the weekends there as well, really to accelerate a uh, development of a vaccine urgently needed. One should consider whether this is something we can think in the future as well. The supply chain today, this was a question there as well, completely improved. We have been, as CureVac, producing RNA since 2006. Um, on a GMP level. What we all produced until uh, the uh, mid-2020 was homeopathic in uh, terms of volume. So even the rare raw materials were not available. This is decentralized possible to acquire today. So we are not running if a pandemic would come into this raw material supply chain issues. I'm pretty convinced on this one. And uh, the collaboration uh, certainly the lesson learned is really the collaboration which we now have also with GSK brings me uh, then to the second question uh, as well, what, what the clinical trials are. We need to have, as a small biotech company, there was no partner at the time we started in mid-2020, and so therefore we had to do it uh, uh, by ourselves. Today we are running these four clinical trials on the lessons learned, on new backbones of RNA which have completely improved. And uh, we do this with uh, different settings in COVID as well as in flu. And we are really looking forward to see the results out of these four clinical trials by the end of the year, beginning of next year, to see what we can do. It's all about preparedness. And then again comes to the improvements of our manufacturing capacity, which we build up with our network there as well, to cope with situations like these. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Haas, and also for sticking to the time. Mrs. Tulen Lenoir, please. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Thank you very much. Presentations, et je vais maintenant m'exprimer. Thank you very much. I will be speaking French. Now, of course, we too would have very much appreciated seeing Mr. Boula here to speak on behalf of Pfizer. We very much welcome all of the expertise of the BioNTech Laboratory and its partner Pfizer over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, this expertise cannot justify a lack of transparency in the contract negotiations. Just to remind us all, clear procedures do exist. And joint procurement is the responsibility of a team of negotiators that are appointed. So they cannot be subject to bilateral negotiations by SMS. The European Parliament last Tuesday definitively adopted my report on cross-border health threats. Now we would like to further strengthen transparency and independence in the drafting of contracts, knowing that you have the intention, and this is a good thing, to continue to work with the European institutions. The Parliament will be representative in the governance side and will be ensuring that the various provisions are respected. So beyond these initial remarks, I do have a few questions for you about the respecting of intellectual property rights. Your company was required to downgrade its expectations in terms of patents at the European Patent Office following a reply from Médecins du Monde, Doctors Without Borders. It was said that your patents were based on existing knowledge using publicly funded research uh, using mRNA vaccine uh, technology. So could I ask you, why did you initially lodge 280 patent requests knowing that the, you were running the risk of penalizing other mRNA um, patent candidates. And is a, because of this legal battle with Pfizer on IP that possibly you were required to abandon your CureVac vaccine? And that last question would be for Mr. Haas, of course. Thank you. Ich werde heute auf Deutsch sprechen. So I'll be speaking German. I'd like to uh, welcome the guests who are joining us here today. I would like to just draw everybody's attention to the fact that we no, are dealing with people who have uh, disabilities, previous conditions, and they were the ones who were most affected by the coronavirus pandemic. Corona isn't over. We know this. We're not talking about a pandemic in the past. We're talking about things that were done. We're facing a situation where currently vaccines were being distributed, but always under the circumstances that the questions were being asked as to why vaccines were being thrown out, why they weren't being distributed properly. Why were there surplus vaccines that, uh, and why couldn't they be donated? And what sort of vested interests were behind all of this? from Pfizer-BioNTech when it comes to expiring vaccines and them having to be thrown out. I must say a lot of people really didn't understand what was behind all of that. Now, are there any plans to bring an end to this, to make sure that we make proper, sensible use of these vaccine doses, that we distribute them properly throughout the world, also the developing world, to those who need them, and that we don't say, oh, well, they haven't met the cold chain for a couple of days, they all need to be disposed of? And also, why do the booster doses cost more than the original doses? We need to ensure that each and every one of us who would like to receive a vaccination should have access to this dose. People with prior conditions, people with disabilities, people living in institutional contexts must have access to these doses. They are the vulnerable groups. I don't like the term vulnerable, but we're using it and we talk about it. So I'm one of them, of course. I'm speaking on behalf of them. Now, unfortunately, here I have to take off my mask in order to speak into the microphone, which is also a risk for me. 
We're talking about a dangerous situation for some people. And we need to really ask ourselves about the distribution of doses and making sure that the doses we have available are used properly. Who's making the decisions about where they're going and how much they're going to cost? I think those are important questions. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Meine Fragen Thank you. My question is for Pfizer. Now, your vaccine has received market authorization, regular market authorization, and this now, after two years, you finally have produced the information on the vaccine quality. So this would imply then the reverse, that there was questionable quality over two years for all of the millions of doses that you provide. And there's also saying that certain clinical data are lacking. Well, which data then would be lacking? What about the questions of the women who uh, gave uh, birth to stillborn fetuses? And we see all these stories in the news talking about hundreds of women who received their vaccination before their third trimester, that 82% of them suffered a spontaneous abortion. So again, my question is, where are the data? And where can we gain access to these clinical data? Now, we know about BA4 and BA5 and the new variants, and we have absolutely no data on that. The quote-unquote antibody uh, lab data is data that's come from mice. So all of the data comes from laboratory mice and we don't have any true data. It's absolutely scandalous. The same is the case when we see that we don't have access to the primary data from the original studies, which would allow an independent examination. So perhaps I can ask Dr. Haas as well about the lack of data there. The data on the, the the Center for Disease Control in the United States showed that millions of uh, Americans were suffering. Some 7.7% required medical treatment following their vaccination. The Florida Department of Health as well found that 84 times higher incidence of heart-related uh, deaths in men within 28 days of the vaccination and so is now actually recommending against the vaccination. Hence my question, are we endangering the lives of millions of people? And would you be doing so if you had were fully covering the product liability, as should be the case? Thank you. Mrs. Small. Yeah, thank you very much. Perhaps uh, first to answer with regard to the patents. Uh, the patent situation was certainly not the case where we withdrew our uh, first COVID vaccine. This was related to the fact that the data we have been expecting were not as, uh, as uh, expected, and this was a quite high bar, especially, and this is what we heard from you, uh, Mrs. Langensieb, that a vaccine should certainly cover all vulnerable uh, uh, population. And this was a point that we, at that time, see, saw that we can do better as well, which we are doing right now, together with our partner on GSK, which we are very much looking forward to see the promising data, as I said. The, uh, I certainly cannot comment on uh, the data of Pfizer, on, especially on the clinical data, um, uh, which, which certainly are not approachable to us as well. However, I see that uh, a vaccine certainly should be safe and efficacious in order to protect healthy people, and I think this is where the entire industry is sticking to, and certainly the regulatory authorities as well, again, not knowing the data, certainly. And the vulnerable people, uh, perhaps uh, to turn into German, um, is this natürlich? Yes, of course. In our initial clinical trials, we also took into account subpopulations we did do studies on them in order to identify any possible uh, health concerns for the different subgroups, prior conditions, uh, pregnant women, and also other subgroups. So these were special clinical trials that we did have planned and which would, of course, include in future vaccine planning as well. Of course, when it comes to broad-based vaccination of the entire population at a global level, well, this would be a prerequisite in order to ensure that we can get out of the pandemic. 
And a final point to respond to the question about the clinical trials. Well, we need to remember the pandemic is not over. We don't know how it's going to end, but we do know that it would help to have a link with a flu vaccine. We need to try and develop something like that as quickly as possible, together with other vaccines that we can possibly adjust through mRNA technology as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And thank you very much for outlining the, the aspect that we do need clear um, processes in order to be able to negotiate contracts and, and also outlining the fact that it takes teams and it actually does take teams. As I mentioned earlier on, um, I was responsible for the, leading the negotiations of contracts uh, for our COVID-19 vaccine as well as our oral outside of the US. And it does require a huge effort from both sides uh, in order to be able to, to achieve that. And, uh, and that certainly has been the case throughout all contract negotiations with all countries, all governments uh, and all uh, organizations. So I just would like to reinforce that and clarify it. Um, coming back to the point on IP, and thank you very much for clarifying the situation uh, regarding your vaccine. Um, but the, just to remind everyone um, that the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine was actually based on BioNTech's proprietary MNRA technology and developed by both Pfizer and, and BioNTech. And, um, and so there, from that point of view, we're very confident in intellectual property and uh, should anybody wish to dispute that, we'd be happy um, to obviously um, support and reinforce um, that as well. Um, coming back to the aspects of wastage, use of vaccines, donations, etc. I think um, the importance here as well is, is making sure that we do instill vaccine confidence um, in citizens in, in every country, because obviously in a pandemic, you're only um, ever as protected as, as your neighbour in that respect. And so from that point of view, I think education uh, amongst patients and healthcare professions is absolutely critical. And um, we have worked very hard to deliver a vaccine uh, at tremendous speed um, in order that is works and is well tolerated. So I do think we need to spend a lot of time working together with community leaders, advocates, uh, organizations and policymakers to make sure that we share information on the vaccine um, to reg you know on the regulatory and the clinical side of it to make sure people are confident to want to first of all take the vaccine um, and as well in terms of access to vaccines obviously we absolutely completely encourage um, the 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 point that you've made in terms of making sure that everyone um, that's el eligible for a vaccine or oral treatment should have access to that. And so therefore your pathways should be very clear in each of the countries um, that is offering um, the oral treatment as well as the vaccines for whatever company um, be made available because it doesn't matter which vaccine you take, it's most important that you have a, a vaccine in that sort of situation. And so vaccine confidence is really, really critical. And the other element that I want to point out as well is that we need to um, understand that COVID-19 fatigue is probably our next real issue. And so therefore, because everybody wants to move on from the pandemic, um, but we really can't leave behind those most vulnerable. And so therefore, we should be doing all we can to continue to make sure that people are, are aware that the pandemic is not over and what options um, from a vaccination, a booster or uh, an oral treatment is available. Mr. Ross. Mrs. I cannot see your name, but you can ask for the floor. You don't just take the floor in this committee. Okay? You can always ask for the floor, but just don't take the floor. Mr. Ross. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will speak in Dutch. I will also like I'd also like to know where Mr. Bula is, why he's not here with us today. Ms. Small, do you have any information? Do you have a mandate from Pfizer to speak freely and openly and answer our questions? You're not going into the content on the question of SMS gate that was raised by Ms. Trillet Noir. Now, you say that you want to avoid misinformation through better information, but this all begins with Pfizer itself. So, Ms. Small, by being transparent on your side. So I'm very curious to know what uh, the fact that uh, the CEO for Pfizer would say that they want to be transparent and then not show up at this commission. 
Mr. Bula is very interested in having billions of euros in profit on the backs of the EU citizens, but is not in provided, willing to provide an explanation. Mr. Bula was personally involved in contract negotiations via SMS with the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. This is why his presence would be absolutely crucial here. Now, the European Ombudsman, the European Court of Auditors have spoken on the consequences of the uh, scandal, and these are very damning. So I really think that Mr. Bula would need to be present and would need to do this in order to ensure full transparency in the process. So a question then for you, Ms. Small, where I would like a clear answer, please. So there are no misunderstandings. Was the Pfizer COVID vaccine tested on stopping the transmission of the virus before it entered the market? If not, please say it clearly. If yes, are you willing to share the data with this committee? And I really want a straight answer, yes or no, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rose. Thank you very much, Mr. Rose. Mr. Martin. Merci, uh, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Chair. My thanks to the Pfizer and CureVac representatives for joining us here today as well. Yes, well, I don't know if you've just heard this, but the aim was for you to answer the questions. And we've been here for an hour now, and we've repeated uh, some questions a number of times, and we have yet to hear any answers. So I'll try and make the task easier for you by giving you yes or no questions, or just a question about a figure. First, on the negotiations, since 2022, this is a question for Pfizer and Kirvak. How many electronic message has your CEO exchanged with the President of the European Commission? Do you support parallel negotiations outside of a formal normal process? Yes or no? Would your CEO also today be sending electronic messages to President von der Leyen? Yes or no? Are there other European or world leaders to whom your CEO is sending electronic messages? How many meetings have your companies had directly and indirectly with Commission staff? Which members of the European Parliament have you had meetings or exchanges? And do you consider that your interests are well defended by lobbies such as FBI and the Vaccine Alliance? So, these are the questions on negotiations, at least a few clear questions for you. On prices, we will be coming back to that because we see systematically we have to raise this question. Why, is a, this is a question for Pfizer now, why has the price gone up by 20%? What's the reason for that? In 2021, your financial director, Frank Stemelio, said that for him, a normal price for a COVID vaccine could be up to 150 euros. Can you confirm that? Do you agree? What should the price of such a vaccine be, according to you? Do you agree with what the People's Vaccine Alliance said a year ago? And, uh, and earn $1,000 per second um, in profit from this? And if not, then how much is your profit? Have you been able to provide bonuses to your management as a result of the profits from this vaccine. And a final question. Public support for the development of this vaccine was key, whether it was in the basic research or in the public support that your partners BioNTech received. So why should you be the sole proprietor of this vaccine? Thank you. Um, Mr. Sinschitz. Thank you very much, Ms. President. I must say that it is really a disgrace that Ms. Borla is not with here us today and even greater disgrace that he doesn't have any real intention of showing up. I must say that we in Croatia know very well how Pfizer works. Pfizer was penalized in 2012 in Croatia for bribing Croatian doctors responsible for registration of medicines and also doctors in bioethics commission who were evaluating clinical trials. And in the end Pfizer had to face $60 million. Back a uh, few years, a few years back, uh, you were also fined, I believe, in the United States for $2.3 billion for false advertising. And it's a long list, but I won't spend my time on that. I'll go straight to my question. My office received an assessment from independent researchers from Canada, uh, 500 of them, Canadian doctors, scientists, and healthcare practitioners, independent. And uh, it is uh, an assessment regarding original trial report from December 
2020. It's, I suppose it's your clinical trial published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine. So in this assessment, they went through your data and they claim that you failed to test your product in a correct way, that you had inadequate control groups, that you had wrong clinical endpoints, that, you, that it was not tested for uh, spread reduction, that you skipped animal testing, uh, failure to report serious adverse events, that the trials were unblinded, and the list goes on and on and on and on. So there are uh, a lot of problems with your trials, they claim. So my question is, were these original trials, according to which the vaccines, your products were approved, for example, in the European Union, were these trials verified by somebody in independent, somebody who is not from Pfizer? Yes or no? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Small, C can I also ask you to go into all of these questions? Even if you don't have the answer, just say you don't Absolutely. have the answer. Because otherwise, there is, there is um, on the SMS um, or WhatsApp, I don't even know what it is, um, it's important that you give Absolutely. an answer. But also on the rise of the price, uh, it is important that, uh, that you give an answer. We had an inquiry of the ombudsman, well, woman, um, on the SMS, we had the ACA report, so it's quite important for this committee uh, that I, Pfizer can give uh, straight answers to that. Please. Yeah, no problem. Um, obviously, if I can be given a little bit of extra time then as well. I'll if, give you two if minutes extra. If, if that's possible, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so let's, um, let's start with the SMS. Texas um, in, in that respect and so uh, and again I do apologize that uh, Dr. Bula is not here and, um, and and hopefully as I said from my experience that I'm able to provide as many um, answers as possible. Now regarding the MS SMS Texas and I know this is very specific but I think everybody understands that during a pandemic uh, we were all working at home and uh, as a result of that I am sure Dr. Bula provided his uh, mobile phone contacts to be able to speak to many leaders around the world, um, including myself. I was able to do that, and I'm sure you did similar situations as well. Uh, regarding your specific question as to whether um, a contract negotiation such as this contract, which you refer to 1.8 billion doses, was negotiated through an SMS, I can categorically tell you that would not be the case. I know that because, as I mentioned earlier on, on. I actually was involved in all the, the negotiation discussions from the very start, uh, from the beginning in 2020. As mentioned, there are very clear procedures and approaches um, at Pfizer, as well as at institutions, governments and organisations. It requires a huge team on both sides to be able to negotiate the complex aspects of what is in contained in a contract. It is not possible, I can assure you, to conduct these things over an SMS text. The number of SMS texts, honestly, I'm being quite genuine here, I have no idea um, how many. So you out and did an, 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 a special number. I cannot, sorry, give you that number. Um, I couldn't even tell you how many I had myself in terms of world leaders because we're not con counting that particular type of statistic. But from the point of view of actually understanding the way that a contract is negotiated, it, is, it takes many days, many hours, many weeks in order to be able to go through the very complex aspect of what a contract contains. Uh, regardless of, you know, in addition to obviously the legal aspects of it, there are delivery schedules, there are uh, supply approaches, um, you know, that's, that's gone down into weeks um, in terms of detail and information in there. And so therefore, from a Pfizer perspective, the, um, the contract followed the uh, appropriate conversations and discussions in a way that a contract takes place. Also, in addition to that, it was awarded through a successful tender process and also all member states uh, via the steering board had all, um, were able to agree to all of the details that contained within that contract. So I hope have been as clear as possible around um, the SMS taxes and the potential parallel conversations that would not be able to take place to conduct a contract as complex as these contracts are regarding our vaccine uh, and also um, in terms of our oral treatment. Um, regarding the question around um, did we know about stopping the immunisation before um, it entered the market? No. Uh, these, um, you know, we had to really move at the speed of science to really understand what is taking place in the market. And from that point of view, we had to do everything at risk. 
I think our Dr. Pudla, even though he's not here, would turn around and say to you himself, uh, if not us, then who? Um, Dr. Pudla actually felt the importance of what was going on in the world. And therefore, as a result of that, we actually um, spent $2 billion at risk uh, of self-funded money from Pfizer to be able to manufacture, as it, well, first of all, research, develop and manufacture at risk to be able to make sure that we were in a position to be able to help um, with the pandemic. And, uh, and I think that's why I feel very good when a recent paper um, from the Imperial College stated that in the first year of the rollout of, of vaccines, um, we saved... Uh, four million people. So from that point of view, I feel that uh, actually we were there when the world needed us to be able to make sure that we were able to help people around the world with, um, with vaccination as well as now oral, oral treatment. I would hate to imagine what situation we would be in in the world right now if companies like us did not take those risks did not um, do clinical research and developments at scale uh, in order to make sure that we could have a vaccine that we could roll out um, to the world. So I, really, I understand your frustrations, I really do. But I also hope at some point, somewhere, you also do appreciate what um, pharmaceutical companies have done in order to be able to roll out and deliver vaccines at such speed and scale. Um, regarding, sorry. Um, Oh, price. Okay. Right. <laughs> Sorry. It, honestly, it's on my notes. I just haven't got to it constantly. It is there, isn't it? Pricing. Um, so, look, I understand you've talked a lot of pricing and thrown out a lot of prices. But from our point of view, we, we cannot discuss pricing. Pricing is confidential. And from that point of view, I know, again, you're going to be very frustrated. I can see it in your faces. You're going to be very frustrated with my answer. But pricing is confidential. And from that point of view, I am not able to have a conversation with you other than to repeat what has always been out there in that we have taken a tiered pricing approach to pricing to make sure that it is affordable for the governments to be able to ensure that uh, citizens can have it without out-of-pocket funding. And in addition to that, we've made sure that low and middle-income countries are having it at not-for-profit. I understand your frustration, but we cannot discuss pricing. It is confidential. I think at a certain moment of time, we will need to take some legislative action with regard to that. But that's open for discussion. Mr. De Haas, uh, Dr. De Haas, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, coming back to the way how to communicate with representatives of the EU Commission, there were no SMSs and we wouldn't send SMSs today. The negotiations have been very intense and uh, very uh, tough because of the time needed. And uh, what we just heard before from Mrs. Uh, Small at the time, certainly we have been doing this negotiations in a very short period of time with a really good team, well equipped on the other side, which went absolutely professional. At the time, it was exactly what we heard. It is even also CureVac as a health care company, we didn't, because there was a question before on the IP, didn't look into this one because the first primary goal was to develop, manufacture and distribute vaccines. And therefore, also with the IP question, we only came later when all of this was at least uh, in a better stage than it, is, uh, than it was before. Certainly, we are working on this even more so to generate new vaccines, better vaccines, and uh, this is a primary goal. We are not at the end of uh, where we should be. The manufacturing certainly is much broader than it was before, which most probably uh, will have a, a, a point on how fast you can be in the future and how di diversified you can generate uh, these uh, clinical data to come, which is then, again, very important to keep up with the transparency what we have been seeing in the beginning, but also now as a transparency and to run clinical uh, trials with comparator products. There was a question before how to run clinical trials, what is the state of care today and how to get much better. And all of this will be in partnership with governments as long as there is a pandemic before it went into uh, or goes into a commercial market. Thank you. Oh, uh, sorry, there's one question whether we are well represented uh, by uh, Vaccines Europe. Yes, we are. 
That's true, the clinical trials. Can anybody take that question? I actually think probably one you talked about the Canada clinical Canada, trial, was it? Yes. Actually, that's... Oh, oh, sorry. The Canada clinical trial, actually, is that what you were referring to? Actually, I, I don't believe any of the information on that. From that point of view, I, I am aware of, but I'm more than happy to get back to you uh, at another point in time to be able to respond to that specific aspect of it. But from my point of view... Oh, do you have, uh, do you have there? No. Well, I'd like to make a comment uh, to that. We have uh, lots of real-world evidence. Uh, there's, uh, Maybe you should introduce yourself yes, because people don't do know that you're from Shivaka. Freiburg. Yes. Yes. From Hi, yes. My name is Bharati Shivaka. I'm a physician and I'm the country medical director for Pfizer. So regarding the clinical data, um, you know, we were in a pandemic. Things had to move on. The regulatory authorities also worked together with us. Um, and those clinical data are published. Post factum, of course, there's a lot of criticism, but I would like to point out to you that we have real-world evidence, real-world data in billions of people around the world, people and patients mm -hmm. around the world, where we know that the, the vaccine is, um, has, um, has been safe and effective. I'd like to stress also the comment that, um, that the colleague from CureVac made, such a vaccine would never be out there for patients, for people, if it wasn't safe enough. So safety is something that is never compromised. The other point that I'd like to make is let us not all forget that we are here thanks to the efforts made by the pharmaceutical companies. We are able to sit here and discuss the COVID committee, what the COVID committee should bring forward thanks to the efforts that were made. I'd like to also make a comment on the, um, the point of the pregnant ladies. There is also um, lots of evidence, lots of real-world evidence from the UK and Israel on um, complications in pregnant ladies who were not vaccinated. So I think um, there's more evidence out there where there were um, less issues with pregnant ladies. I can, I can provide you the data later on. Okay, okay, Let, let's... Let, no, ex Shh. Again, again. Look, people, people. Mrs. Limmer, it is impossible to have, a, to have a committee meeting if you start shouting. You have to ask for the floor. That is how people communicate with each other. Um, but, Mr. Sinschitz, if you give us uh, the report, um, uh, we can uh, give it to CureVac and to, to well, Absolutely. To Spice. Arrange. Arrange. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Mrs. Uh, uh, Kluner, please. First of all, I'd like to thank um, both our, our guests today for... Uh, their contributions in helping us to learn, uh, shed some light on lessons learned from the pandemic and understand how, how we can move forward and certainly prevention and preparedness are important. And I do take note uh, of the comments regarding resilient global supply chains, which I think probably are very important as well. I'd like to ask a couple of questions really on um, the role of the European Health Union in encouraging more focused medicine development and enhancing innovation for, for both our guests and um, what, what, can we, what can we do more to encourage that and from your experience engaging with the Commission, what guidance would you have for the Committee on the mobilisation of collective intelligence and the fostering of new public partnership, private partnerships? And I'd like to ask Ms. Small as well about, you mentioned Accord and um, it's, I, know, I see it's launched in May this year. Uh, providing 1.2 billion uh, vaccines, maybe I'm, I'm, you might correct me on that. But we, we visited BioNTech recently as a committee, and they had uh, they were tell, telling us about um, their a, a type of technology transfer that they had in place. And could you ask me why, or could you explain why not technology transfer, why direct direct donations? Uh, because it would seem to me that it gives more um, autonomy, maybe the wrong word, to th those countries if they do have. Uh, support in developing the vaccines themselves. Thank you very much, Mrs. Jerkovic. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the onset of the pandemic, the European Union 
uh, has been very determined to provide its citizens with safe and um, effective uh, vaccine uh, as soon as possible. And the EU was so determined that the part of the developmental, uh, development costs faced by the vaccine um, producers were actually uh, financed with down payments from the EU budget. Well, some companies um, at the beginning of pandemic provided its COVID-19 vaccine to the countries on the non-for-profit base. Uh, they gave up their financial gains uh, uh, amid this uh, global crisis. I don't remember your company showing solidarity uh, with those in need at the beginning of the pandemic. So my question, Ms. Moll, is am I wrong? And if I'm not, uh, what is your justification for this lack of social responsibility? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Jarkovic. Ms. Montserrat. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. No, uh, no, 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 oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak in Spanish. When you approved the first vaccine and, and said it was successful and the majority of uh, the EU citizens trusted your efficiency, but then there was a saturation of information as to how many doses were necessary, the age bracket, how efficient it was, and to see which vaccinations were better. Could one same vaccine apply, approved was applied differently by EMA? We've had so much information, sometimes contradictory, less and less uh, citizens started deciding to be vaccinated. A vaccine should not only be uh, uh, asked for by the citizens when they have to uh, travel, but they have to get fast vaccinated to help uh, protect them. What has failed now? Who failed in providing access to information? With everything we know, as we're in this committee, lessons learned, what do we have to improve? With all we know, if we take a step backwards, what should you do to improve the situation, to simplify things for informing the population on your vaccine? Should we have more access to brochures? We always have access to all the brochures on medicines prescribed. What must the member states and EMA and institu European institutions improve in their provision of information for the citizen? Thank you. To ask the question and then Dr. Haas. Could I I ask um, for the question to be repeated by the social responsibility? Yeah, I told you. I told you that I do not remember that uh, at the beginning of the pandemic you showed uh, the social responsibility by giving the, the vaccine uh, at the base of non profit to some countries. At some company, I will not mention which one you know perfectly, did. Okay, thank you again very much for all your questions and I will try to answer as many as possible in as, as quick a time as I, as I possibly can um, in, in that respect. I think coming back to the whole manufacturing aspects of things, look, because of the, the speed at which we were moving, uh, we took take a different approach. We took a very centralised approach in terms of manufacturing because we wanted to be able to manage the end-to-end -end process because we've got scale and reach across the whole globe. And, uh, and therefore, we want to be able to move really, really quickly. However, most recently, um, we have now started to do CMOs, one in South Africa with BioNTech, which is actually Phil and Finish, and one in Brazil with Europharma Labs, which is also Phil and Finish. So, um, so we do have that aspects of things. And also with our... Um, our treatment, um, our oral treatment, we also do have a, um, a contract with MPP, so we're also doing voluntary license agreements on that aspects of things as, as well. And actually leading that will lead very nicely in terms of the, the partnership that you asked about, Accord for the Wealthier World, because this was all about supporting uh, equitable access. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we had as much equitable access to our medicines beyond vaccines and our oral treatment. So we made sure that we 
um, this initiative really drives patented medicines that, as I mentioned earlier on in the upfront, um, is, you know, that are available in the US or the EU on a not-for-profit basis that allows it to go to 1.2 billion uh, people in, in 45 lower-income countries. And uh, we've also worked with other life science uh, leaders as well, including Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to make sure we've also got access to, to our treatments. And so this is very, very important for us. And I think that actually comes back very nicely to the social responsibility in terms of not-for-profit um, aspects of things, is that we've made it very clear, and I know we've had this conversation on pricing, and I know from a, conf a confidentiality point of view I'm not able to declare that, but we have made it, made it very clear through our tiered pricing approach that we would make our vaccines and our oral treatment available on a not-for-profit basis to low- and low-middle-income countries. And we've actually done that from the start. Uh, so every time when we announced um, our vaccine um, tiered pricing approach, we have mentioned in every messaging that we've put out that it's low, um, it's not for profit for low, low and middle income countries, and exactly the same for our oral treatment, Paxlovid. It is not for profit uh, for the low and low middle income countries. In addition to this new um, initiative that we have as well, which is the Accord for a Healthier World. All those medicines, 23 of them, including our oral treatment, are available at a not-for-profit price for those countries that are interested in taking them. I don't know if I covered all of those. Oh, there was one about vaccination, wasn't there, in terms of um, that and education, etc. So I think um, in a pandemic, as I mentioned, we've really got to make sure that we've got a lot of vaccine confidence taking place. And so therefore, education among patients and healthcare professions is really, really going to be critical. So it's very important that we continue this partnership taking place. And we are very happy um, to engage with all governments, all healthcare providers around the globe to help to provide as much information as you feel you really need to help um, patients really understand vaccine, to really help with vaccine confidence, because we need to help um, you know, patients really be prepared because a vaccine, you know, only, only once it's in an arm does it become a vaccination. And so we are very much engaged to make sure, please reach out to us, whichever country that you're in, to make sure that we can engage and help you with education materials. But at the end of the day, it does come down to the healthcare professionals and the stakeholders in the countries because obviously those are the ones that are in front of patients actually having their vaccination in order to be able to help them get the confidence to really make sure we can follow through and not have the vaccine hesitancy aspect of things because as I mentioned pandemic is not over the winter is coming and we need to make sure that in addition to that we don't have the COVID fatigue as well so everything that we can do together is actually going to make a difference I believe in that aspects of things as well Yeah, perhaps uh, coming to this latter point there as well. I think there are different levels of uh, transparency. So we as CureVac, we have been working 20 years on mRNA, which is a transparency on the technology where others could build on top in order to, to take the technology when it is needed, which is in uh, scientific papers, in patents, which are public, of course, in order to make this happen. And then there's a second uh, uh, class of transparency as well, which is clinical data, which is certainly the basis of building trust. And it's all about trust if you want to treat uh, and, uh, healthy people in order to be protected, which is exactly in the pandemic what you need to do. And uh, this transparency is a must in order to do. And then there is a third one, is, which came in this pandemic on top, is, and thank you very much for the question, uh, to say what is it what we all can do, including the healthcare systems, to say there is a new molecule, which is mRNA, and it is the first vaccine approved. There was no broad in the public experience with this molecule, so what does it do? There was a lot of misinformation, uh, what, what the RNA at the end of the day can do and what the potential is, and I think there is much more potential we can take out of this in vaccines, but in all, also in other areas. And this is also where the collaboration needs to start with the healthcare systems, but also uh, in the public awareness what RNA is and what it uh, can do also for future vaccines. So I would really uh, classify this transparency in these three orders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Luca. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Now, Ms. Small, I do think it's very important that you talked about the holistic approach because it's so important to deal with this comprehensively. 
And that's why I would like to take a post-vax syndrome into question, this whole idea. And I'm not doing this because I'm trying to discredit you or I want to gain political capital from this as some others in society might on the right. Rather, I'm doing it because I'm thinking about the people. And when you look at people, you see, well, we were talking about 0.01 to 0.02 percent, and now the Frau Ehrlich Institute, which is responsible for this in Germany, is talking, which is responsible for adverse events, is talking about 0.03. If you multiply that by 180 million vaccinations over the two-year period, we're actually talking about more than 50,000 people with ADRs. That is a small-sized city. And these are the people we need to think about. We can't forget them. So my question then to you is this. As a vaccine producer, to what degree are you thinking about these people? What sort of research are you doing in order to help these people to ensure that we don't have the severe adverse events? I'm thinking spike protein advances here. And a second question, when it comes to treatment, medication, can there be something done in order to help these people out of this very difficult situation that they find themselves in? Thank you. Oui, toi. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, first of all, I have to say that I agree with all those colleagues who don't understand the absence of Dr. Bourla. I think, Chair, we ought to invite him once again to get an explanation at least about the issue with the Court of Auditors because that is very specific. We have very specific questions to put to him. Uh, if otherwise we can do what we did with Monsanto and, and uh, not give them access to the Parliament anymore uh, because we feel that he should be interviewed by this committee. Uh, otherwise, uh, Saiza will just be uh, left out of, of Parliament's workings. Now, on the quality of the vaccines, there was a confidential document sent to the EMA by Pfizer and this came out uh, of a review of Trailset News that in the vaccine there have to be uh, the messenger RNAs which are intact and they stated a percentage that would guarantee the efficacy of the vaccine that is has to be 70% in the in the vaccine itself and on the 20th of November 2020 before the official authorization it was seen that there was degraded RNA it went from 70% to 50% so my question why are we having these issues there's no guarantee because we have other rates uh, which might uh, create secondary effects, repercussions. So who changed the threshold? You've always given us uh, data, but not broken down data. So we have to look at uh, the different laboratories where the, the vaccine is produced. And the last point I'd like to make, which is very important, Pfizer has forbidden the purchasers to carry out their own independent analysis of the quality of the vaccine doses. That's un unbelievable. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank, to thank the uh, chair for uh, the fact that it's very important to have the facts. And why is Dr. Burla not here? Mm. He hasn't got 10 minutes to give to the committee. Uh, that doesn't give us a great deal of confidence. He prefers um, SMS messages and t t tweets. Uh, you don't want to talk about prices, it would seem. Oh, let's speak about something else, the, the, the secondary effects. The last report of the uh, Medicines Safety Committee in France spoke about uh, pulmonary embolisms and there are many uh, secondary effects which are negative and uh, have produced 
fatalities. So what is the basis here for uh, progress on this and responsibility, liability? The speaker has lost her microphone. And your shareholders should know that uh, that there is a liability there and that should be uh, problematic for you. Uh, and uh, this uh, money should be used to uh, indemnify the victims. And uh, the pandemic uh, is, is now, as it were, over. So what about the disinformation campaigns? I'm going to start with you. Is that okay? Oh, okay. Yeah. Perhaps <clears throat> you may keep on uh, answering in uh, English the post vaccine syndrome. So, um, with our vaccine development, uh, may it be the first one or the second one, certainly we are following up with all pay, uh, uh, people treated in order to see exactly what you can do and uh, how you really can prevent these kind of syndromes. The problem um, we have seen here is. Uh, exactly one thing where we stopped the first uh, product candidate development because it didn't meet our high criteria which we wanted to achieve. Um, and uh, certainly if a vaccine is uh, approved, this will be followed up with in order to find out exactly where the vaccine is ending. Spike protein, as you said, uh, as, a, uh, as a, uh, one of the buzzwords. And uh, this is exactly where we are focusing the second generation uh, optimization of the RNA on, next to further developments, which is um, certainly also the delivery of the vaccine, which uh, one cannot expect to have uh, then uh, uh, logistically delivered uh, at minus 80 degree. So there's a lot of uh, development uh, to, to go into. That's much I can say to this. Thanks. Mr. Small. Thank you. I'll hand over to Dr. Shivalke in a minute regarding some of the medical questions. But I really do feel I need to keep addressing the comments that has come up throughout this hearing regarding SMS um, contracts, and obviously Dr. Bull is not here. And, uh, and, I, and I really want to keep addressing it because obviously at the end of the day, it's actually about the contract negotiations because it's believed that SMSs were used, as mentioned earlier on, to create a, a bilateral conversation. And actually, again, I really need, it's important to stress to everyone here today that the process for awarding the contract was for following a very robust process from both Pfizer side and the European Commission side. So I think I understand that Dr. Bula is not here, but I am here to let you know that that did actually happen in a very thorough and robust manner. So I'll just hand over to um, Dr. Shvalka, who actually can talk a little bit more about some of the um, medical aspects of things. And if we need to get back to you with some data in the way that we just talked about earlier on, we are more than happy to be able to do that. Right. Thank you for that. So um, I'd like to um, address then the question about the degraded mRNA. Indeed, this is a problem, and that's the reason why we had to um, develop technology to be able to supply the vaccines at minus 80 degrees. Hmm? So um, we are constantly working on improving the technology, and uh, we are able to now provide vaccines that can be kept at room temperature. Well, at, at regular fridge temperatures and then also uh, kept at room temperatures before actually administering them. But this has been an issue in the beginning and we tackled it at that point in time uh, in the way we could. Having in Puce, Belgium, for example, we had 700 fridges um, and, and, and really um, um, a whole, um, I should say, a field of uh, fridges at minus 80 degrees that were keeping those uh, vaccines. Why did you change the threshold from 70 to 55 percent? 70 percent to 50 percent. Why and who? Who has changed that? You mean the, de the degrading of the mRNA, you mean? Sorry, I, I don't follow your question. Maybe, okay, okay, Mrs. Rivazi, Mrs. Rivazi, we'll put it on paper. If it's so technical, we'll put it on paper because otherwise we go 
from one to the other, but um, we will put it on paper. Eh? But c'est pas que technique. No, 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 no. It's not technical. Put it on paper and we'll ask a written, a written answer to that, because otherwise we will lose uh, too, much, too much time. Did we cover the questions? Then I go to... Um, Mrs. Anderson, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is quite ridiculous what we're doing here. And pursuant to Article 200 and, uh, Rule 211 of the rules, uh, rules of Procedure, I am proposing that this committee declares itself incompetent in getting clarification on the content of the contracts between EU Commission and pharmaceutical companies with regards to the mRNA vaccines in general and the exchange of text messages between Ursula von der Leyen, President of EU Commission, and Mr. Borla, CEO of Pfizer. In particular, it is quite you, obvious in today's Mrs. Anderson, proceedings. Mrs. Anderson, we'll put that on the agenda. No, of no, the no. I will raise my point of order now, and according to the rules, you will have to let me continue. Okay, you continue. Thank you. But it is not, quite not obvious. More than a minute, not more than a minute. You don't have to make full statement. Okay. Just... This committee lacks the authority to get to the bottom of crucial questions. The fact that Mr. Borla, CEO of Pfizer, had the audacity to refuse to appear in front of this committee to answer questions constitutes a gross disregard for the people whose tax money he took, by the way. If we cannot compel a crucial player to appear in front of this committee, then this committee is useless. So I propose that we declare ourselves incompetent, and I furthermore propose that this committee concludes the need for a, a committee of inquiry and formally requests the Conference of Presidents to initiate the st necessary steps to propose uh, the okay. EU Parliament in setting up such a committee as provided in Rule 208 in conjunction with Article 226 of the Treaty uh, on the Functioning of the European Union to ensure the peoples of Europe's right to democratic okay, Mrs. Anderson, now I, recourse. I am going to and cut finally, you. I, I going request to cut the roll call vote on these uh, proposals. Thank you very much. We will. We will have a discussion at the coordinators and, of course, the ID group can go to the Conference of Presidents. Can I remind this committee, this is not an investigating committee. Exactly. This is a special committee. Um, and this falls not within, um, well, the remits of uh, this committee. So okay. we will have a discussion in the coordinators and the ID group no, can Madam Chair, take I just all the initiatives raised, towards raised the, the Conference of, of Presidents. And now I cut you off. This is it. Okay? Okay. We will have to vote on the, the declaration of in, uh, incompetency in this committee. That we can do. Yeah. We will, we will have to look at the coordinators and we will then decide how to proceed on the issue. So, in other words, you refuse to take the vote right now that yes, I just I proposed as a point of order. You refuse? Just yes Mrs. or no? Let me see. We, we will take that up at the coordinators and if, you, if, a necessary, is there a, if there a vote is necessary, we will come back to that. Don't okay. worry. So, we in other words, you refuse. All the procedures. Okay. Refuse to take a vote I, on a point of now, order I raised. I give the floor just now for the record. to Mr. Thank Teres. You. I give the floor now to Mr. Teres. Thank you so much. I was paying very close attention to everything that was said here, and I cannot hide my shock. And, you know, nobody answered concrete questions that all of my colleagues asked. We heard allegations here and statements from the representative of Pfizer stating, and I quote, that they cannot release the contracts because they have certain interests. What about the interests of the people? What about their health? Because it's, it's our authority and our job to make sure that we get to the bottom of this. So the first question that I address to you is the following. Just yes or no. When exactly are you going to fully publish the contracts that you sign between Pfizer and the European Commission? Second question. You were mentioning the risks and you gave us some billions of euros that the, your company invested in producing these vaccines. What about the health of the people who are actually put at risk by being injected with these medical products that clearly, in some cases, might have adverse effects? So the second question is, is Pfizer liable according to the secret contracts that none of us saw? So we want to know exactly. Is Pfizer liable? or responsible for any adverse effects produced by your own products. Third question. Has Pfizer had access 
to the coronavirus before December 2019 when we knew about it. And here's the reason why I'm asking for it. The whole world found out about the COVID or coronavirus in December of 2019. On January the 11th, 2020, the Chinese government published, and I quote, the genetic data of this vaccine, of this virus. But in the data that your company submitted to EMA in order to receive marketing authorization, you provided data showing that you tested your medical product, and I quote, on, you started the test on January 14th, 2020. So I'm asking you, how is it possible that in three days, after the whole world found out the genetic data of this virus, your company already tested the vaccine on mice? Thank you. And finally, Mrs. Uh, Zambelli. Zambelli? No? Ah, okay, you are on my list. Sorry for that. Then Mrs. Donato. If, um, Donato, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I go ahead in Italian language. Um, I'd like to thank the representative of Pfizer for answering the questions about SMSs, saying that there was a change, an exchange, not only with the uh, Commission president, but with other European leaders, uh, which was uh, quite uh, informative. This is interesting news. But you may not know that in the EU, there are certain standards for transparency, and that requires communications, which are so important for our legislation, for the lives of Europeans, must be made through official channels, and there must be documents that can be released and consulted uh, for, by all citizens and the European Parliament. So we've taken note of this type of communication, and we are sure that uh, you will act on the fact that you said that normally this type of communication should uh, come in documents. And it, we, can't, we have seen that you don't want to reveal the content of these communications. Now, as for the clinical uh, objections which have been raised, you've refused to answer these questions. Thousands of studies have affirmed some of these problems, but the lack of transparency on certain clinical trials, uh, uh, of course, uh, shows that uh, it, it's going to uh, undermine trust. How are you going to reconquer citizens' trust if you answer none of the questions on transparency? Now, you've mentioned science, and you said you've been acting on science, and that there could be a variant which uh, could be even more damaging uh, uh, and uh, more contagious and less more severe. How do you know that there's no virus that might escape a laboratory and hit our continent? And our, where did you get the information? Thank you. Um, one to Curvac. Um, you mentioned that you lack a good, a big partner to uh, to do the, the necessary clinical trials. Would you a little bit forward looking because this um, this committee is all, will also look at. Yeah, recommendations for the future and how to make Europe more resistant. Um, in the United States, you have a public authority that does clinical trials. Would you be in favor of having such a, 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 an institution at European level? And how would you look at that? Um, and to Mrs. Uh, Small from, from Pfizer, um, do, do you think if you would have handled the whole discussion on intellectual property rights um, uh, in, in the developing world, um, and you would have been much more open to the idea because at the end there was a negotiation on the TRIPS waiver and we went forward half full or half empty. We can have a full discussion on that. But if we would have started from the start, eh, um, as mentioned by Mrs. Jerkovic, being socially responsible and, and, and really sharing our technology and the full technology, not just the patent, but the full technology with the rest of the world, that it would have ended the pandemic uh, sooner and even more important that it would support it, um, vaccines. Well, it would have helped in the, in the vaccine hesitancy um, that you sometimes see now because of the lack of trust that has grown on the basis of not being trustworthy, I think, uh, from that uh, point of view. Mr. Haas. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, in the beginning of the pandemic, this was a time um, when hardly anyone was able uh, and allowed to travel. Uh, we had to run a clinical trial of 40,000 subjects uh, plus globally. Uh, and and uh, we reached out uh, to partners because the vaccine market is very consolidated. Most of the partnerships have already been consolidated or pharma companies have been running their own uh, um, vaccine programs. So today we are, uh, together with GSK, uh, in a very good uh, situation to have a strong partner with all the logistics, CureVac 1000 people, and uh, to, to have exactly access to this kind of quality to run clinical trials. Today, but as we learned, the pandemic is not over. That's the first thing because the variants are coming uh, in and we don't know what it will do towards uh, the end of this year or even going beyond. But we have today a technology which is mRNA, one among others, but we have got a mRNA technology which is capable to do much more. So the partnership goes far beyond also to run clinical trials, to have comparators to what is the state of the art because we see that the that the virus is escaping exactly the protection. And this is why the uh, efficacy goes down and we need to keep on further investing into R&D and run clinical trials. So partnerships are important, very important, especially for small companies to have in order to cope with the situation. That's the first thing, but this goes beyond the partnerships. Coming back to your questions on, most probably you're uh, uh, referring to BARDA and uh, what is in the US, certainly very open to engage into this endeavor here as well, because what we said in the beginning, and I clearly believe in what I said, is that we need it at the time, but even now in the future as well. We need to have this collaboration, transparent collaboration, also with policymakers and regulatory authorities. So yes, we are open for these kind of partnerships and happy to consider. Thank you. This is small. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, I've also got a number of questions here. I think I'll come back to, first of all, the whole aspects of IP. Um, I, I think uh, from Pfizer's point of view, and uh, this is really important, is we do not believe that the IP is and will ever be an obstacle um, to you know, managing, uh, manufacturing scale-up or even equitable access um, in that respect to COVID-19 vaccines or our, or our therapeutics. Because without that IP foundation, we wouldn't be actually having these conversations about our innovative approach to vaccines and our, our oral treatment. I think in order to be able to achieve um, equitable global access, what we really need to do is focus on the issues, um, the real issues that are at hand on the ground. And that is um, the health system infrastructure in, in a number of these countries, as well as ensuring that we have trained healthcare professionals. Um, in addition, what we talked about earlier on is there's low vaccine confidence and sometimes misinformation that takes place. As I mentioned, through the Accord um, uh, for a Healthier World, we are already in negotiations with a number of countries um, in, in Africa. I, I can't talk about the countries because obviously, unless they announce, we're not able to share that information. But what we're spending time with them on is really understanding the patient journey. And um, because what is it that's actually causing an issue in terms of that access? And, once, and we're working with governments to understand that patient journey. And once we've understood that patient journey, what we're then going to do is actually try to identify some partners who can help us with that um, understanding of the patient journey. And it could be diagnostics. It could be um, that we need certain specialised healthcare professionals on the ground. So as we come um, and understand that a little bit more, then we'll be able to understand truly what are the barriers to access um, in, in those and those countries coming back to your comments about clinical trials i do understand you don't feel that you've had them answered today but there's a lot of, of questions that you asked regarding that and i can assure you we will take those questions away and we'll be able to respond to them so that you actually have the satisfactory answers around that so please be assured of that um, in terms of um contracts you mentioned you're quoting me um, in the sense that obviously it's interests of ours actually it's interests of the governments that need the vaccines and the oral treatments that we do not want to prejudice and that for us is really important and i'm sure that's important to you to make sure again in the spirit of equ equitable access we don't prejudice ongoing discussions that we have with governments to ensure that they can have access to our vaccines and our oral treatments uh, as well 
Um, and, uh, and again, I'll come back to the SMS element of it. As I mentioned, as all of us, we're in a pandemic. And actually, we, we are in unprecedented situations and unprecedented times where sometimes, as I mentioned, um, messages are channeled through phones as opposed to the normal office in that respect as well. Um, did I miss anything? I think one, one question, Mr. Teres. Yeah, just one, one question. I'm not asking about the ongoing discussions that Pfizer has with certain governments. I'm asking and my colleagues and people, the European citizens, the journalists, media, people who are in this room are asking for the contracts already signed because the European Commission published a version of these contracts in a redacted format and tens of pages of these contracts are totally blacked out. These are the contracts that we're interested in. Thank you. Yeah. But we use a global set of terms for our contracts. And so therefore, what's contained in the European Commissions are contained in everybody else's contracts to that degree. There are some, obviously, nuances depending on local regulations, but that is the issue, is that we use a global set of terms regarding it. You did have another question, actually, for, if I may, if I may, regarding indemnity. Yes, indemnity in that respect. So, so we walk away. Oh. <laughs> They obviously want me to stop talking um, in that respect. And, you know, as we, we talked about, you know, how do we have responsibilities as well? Absolutely. The, the safety and efficacy of medicines and vaccines is always the highest priority for all pharmaceutical companies in, in, in that respect. And so, you know, in that we, these indemnities that we have within our contracts do not remove responsibilities for the manufacturers for the production of a safe and effective vaccine. And, uh, and so I probably in terms of the time, have yes. to stop there. But I do really thank you for your questions and those that we haven't um, responded to because of time, I can assure you we'll get back to particularly on the clinical and more uh, technical questions. Well, the technical questions, please send us the studies and a very specific technical question also, Mrs. Rivazi, so we, you can still come back in, in answering these que technical questions because I think that is important. That concludes the first part. Uh, we have another hearing after this one. Um, let me thank Dr. Haas and Mrs. Uh, Small. You had to endeavour a lot of questions about your CEO not being present here, but I, I think I can speak for a majority of the, of the members of this parliament, of this committee, that we were happy that you were here um, um, and that we uh, regret um, that Mr. Borrell um, wasn't. I... Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait a second. Please, please. We, we take a break of five minutes because we have to connect to people of the other hearing, uh, mainly of Novavax and GSK will be online. So five minutes and then we will continue. Anglais, anglais, anglais.